last days. Of course, one's in Acts chapter number 2, and the other's in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Acts chapter 2 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. And, and I, think, I think to understand the Bible, you've got to have a... You've got to rightly divide the Bible to understand it. And that means that you have to see who is speaking, to whom is the, the, the statement being made, and uh, get some kind of, in your mind, is it before Calvary, is it after Calvary? Things certainly make a difference between Calvary and after Calvary. And then there are many things that are different even after Calvary, after the cross. So what we do on this to make a, make a distinction so we can understand, you've seen this thing a bunch of times here, and that is we're going to try to, again, see some right division. We'll put the chart here. This will help us understand where we are, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Now, in the last days, Acts chapter number 2 and 2 Timothy 3, both those passages use, the, use that phrase, in the last days. And uh, in Acts chapter number 2, Peter's preaching. The Word of God says he stands up with the 11, standing up with the 11 there in Acts 2 and verse 14. Verse number 17, he said, in the last days, certain things are going to take place. And then all these things are listed. So we've got in the last days there in Acts 2 and verse number 17. Then 2 Timothy chapter number 3. We have in Acts chapter number 2, and I'm going to do that in a different color here. Acts chapter number 2. We've got in the last days. And Peter then describes some things that God says is going to happen in the, in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Paul says, in the last days. And he's got some last days here. Of course, what I'm saying, we've got... We've got two different sets of last days. There's a, there's a real division between these. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, and then after each one of these, there's a, there's a list of things to tell you what these last days are like. And actually, between the two, it's just, a, just almost opposite of what's going to take place or what is taking place. In Acts chapter number 2, in verse number 14, Peter standing up with the 11. Now in the Bible, whenever you have 12 apostles, this is always important to the nation of Israel. For example, look back in Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter 19. The Lord Jesus Christ made a promise in Matthew 19 and verse number 28 that in a future day that the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, I shouldn't say the 12 there. Peter asked a question in verse number 27. He said, Lord, we behold, we've forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? In other words, those of us who forsaken all and followed thee, what shall we have therefore? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Verily I say unto you, verse 28, that ye which have followed me. Of course, we know that Judas Iscariot didn't follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a traitor. And that in Acts chapter number 1, Matthias took his place. And so in Acts chapter 2, whenever Peter stands up with the eleven, the Word of God recognizes Matthias as the twelfth apostle. And so you have Matthias there in Judas Iscariot's place, and one of the qualifications for Matthias being put into that place was that he was faithful and he followed with the Lord, with the disciples, all the way from the baptism of John to the day he was taken up. So Matthias just quietly followed the Lord, stayed with him, was faithful throughout his ministry up to the all the way from the baptism of John up to the ascension, and then he was put into the position of apostle, put into the office of, the, of an apostle 
after Judas Iscariot had uh, uh, killed himself. Now, Matthew 19, Jesus said in verse 28, Ye which have followed me. See, he didn't say, you twelve apostles. The word of God is very exact, very precise. Had uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said, you twelve are going to sit upon twelve thrones, well then, Lord Jesus wouldn't have known who Judas Iscariot was. The Bible says that uh, Jesus said one time on another occasion, he said, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? He knew it. John chapter 6 and verse 7. So he said, ye which have followed me in the regeneration. Now that's a regeneration as far as this, this uh, earth is concerned. In the regeneration. That's the regeneration as far as the nation of Israel is concerned. In the re regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. That's here upon this earth. Jesus Christ sits in the throne of his glory. See, it's the Lord, it's the Lord Jesus Christ's throne. It's the throne of his glory. That's not God the Father's throne. See, right now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's seated uh, in his Father's throne. And uh, he's not on his throne. But one day he's going to come back to this earth and he will be seated upon the throne of his glory, the Son of Man. Jesus said, Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, the reason in Acts then, chapter number 2, Peter stands up with the eleven. He's addressing, he's addressing the nation of Israel. Peter and the eleven... So you've got 12 apostles in place. They're all ready for the regeneration of this heaven, of the earth, the regeneration of Israel. They're ready for Jesus to come back. And Peter here in Acts chapter number 2, the Holy Ghost has just come down from heaven. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost, and they are enabled to speak. People are enabled to hear them. Some unusual things have taken place here. And Peter's standing there, and now he addresses the nation of Israel. Peter with the eleven, he lifted up his voice in Acts 2 and verse 14. He said, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, hearken to my words. And then later on he says, Ye men of Israel, ye men of Israel, hear these words. So what you have, see, here you have the Lord Jesus, you, you have the Lord Jesus Christ promising that there's going to be a regeneration. These twelve are going to sit with him upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So you've got a nation, 12 tribes of Israel, and they're going to be judging and sitting upon those thrones, Lord Jesus Christ and his throne. So here in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up with 11. It's got to do with that the national aspect of Israel in the regeneration. Peter doesn't know anything at all about the rapture of the church. He hasn't been told the rapture of the church. No one's been told the rapture of the church. In fact, Peter doesn't really understand the church as the body of Christ. He doesn't understand it. See, whenever Peter's told to go to some Gentiles, he's really shocked that he's supposed to go to a Gentile. Later on, I mean, we're not shocked that we're supposed to go to everybody. We shouldn't be. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be going to a lost world, ambassadors to a lost world. Uh, Peter was shocked that uh, he would go over and so finally, finally he says, the Lord showed me I shouldn't call any man common or unclean. And you know where Peter said that? Peter didn't say that in Acts 2. Peter said that in Acts chapter number 10, whenever he goes over to Cornelius' household. So, so in Acts chapter number 2, these last days, Peter and the 11 apostles, he stands with the 11. He's the spokesman. He's God's spokesman. And he speaks and he addresses the nation of Israel. And he said, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. Look at Acts 2 and look at verse number, verse number 16. Peter said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, Peter understands to some degree this thing's coming to pass. They've just been baptized with the Holy Ghost and there's some outward, listen, there's some visible outward manifestations in the baptism with the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. Um... For one thing, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. 
Now, it would be just like if, if, if we were here, let's say we were the apostles there. And by the way, the, the apostles were the ones with the cloven tongues like as a fire, you know, there. And it said, it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. It would be like you looking over here at Steve Sanders and there's, it's, it's a cloven tongue of fire just right on top of his head up there. I mean, just sitting, just... Uh, uh, it sat upon each of them, just right up above in there. And I don't, you know, I don't think it's a small, you know, just small. Word of God says they appear to them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. And, I mean, there's some visible things here associated with this. And then they began to speak with other tongues. And, by the way, tongues in the Bible, verse 6, defines what tongues are. Notice the end of the verse, every man heard them speak in his own language. If uh, Wilbert stood and spoke in Ilongo, that would be an unknown tongue to you. You couldn't confirm what he said. You couldn't interpret what he said. You, don't, you wouldn't know whether he spoke Tagalog or Ilongo. You wouldn't, know, you, you wouldn't know the difference between the two unless you'd been trained in the language. And uh, that would be an unknown tongue tongue to you. That would be an unknown language. Now, if there's an interpreter present, then, then that would take care of the problem. Well, what I'm saying is, in the Bible, in the Bible, there's no such thing as gibberish uh, where you, you, you make some kind of sound and that there's n no, it's no language connection whatsoever. I've heard folks say, you know, these they spoke with tongues, and that means there's groanings which, groanings which cannot be uttered. The Bible says, Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Well, friend, if, if, the, if you can't utter them, that means you can't make, you don't do the sound. And everybody I've ever, ever heard try to speak in tongues, they were making the sound. I mean, they were using this vocal, this, this voice box, and they were coming out of this throat. It, they didn't come from somewhere over here or something. They came out of that physical body. And the Word of God says that whenever the Spirit makes intercession for you, that's Romans 8, by the way, that's whenever you get on over here. In Romans 8, when the Spirit of God makes intercession for you, He makes intercession with groanings that you don't utter. You're not involved in it. I, can I say it like this? It's intercession within the Godhead. God the Holy Spirit prays for you in a way that you could never and you don't know how to pray for yourself. Now, that's some of the blessings we get in this age of grace. God's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. See, all that we could ask, God does exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think. Sometimes I think we put too much, too much importance on our prayer life not enough importance upon God and the work of the Spirit of God on our behalf in this age. Thank God for His work for me. Uh, I'm not, look, I, you know, I'm not, I, th I my, et my eternal security, and by, by the way, I believe I'm eternally secure. <laughs> I'm saved. My eternal security doesn't depend upon my behavior. Well, if it's by grace, it's no more of works, the Word of God says. And, and really, my security, the, the real basis of the believer's security in this age is the work of the Holy Spirit, and he did it, and you, don't, you didn't even know it. You, didn't, you, didn't, you couldn't feel it. You couldn't see it. You couldn't taste it. You couldn't smell it. You, there's no way you can know it other than read it in the Bible. It's the only way you know it, and that's this. Whenever, whenever you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God says you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. You're no longer in the flesh to live after the flesh like you had before. You're circumcised and then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. He seals you. You didn't have anything to do with it. God did it. It was an operation by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, and you're sealed by the Spirit of God. And, and there you are, you're sealed. He's the seal. And in order for me to get lost, somebody got to break the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sealed until the day this body's redeemed. 
And that's the real security of the believer. That, that is the real foundation and basis of our security. The Spirit of God sealed you until the day of redemption, the day of the redemption of this body. Because I, I sure, with the Spirit of God, I'm sealed here, you know. Uh, here, I'm going to tell you something. I still, I still can walk after the flesh. I still can do that. But you know what? It's against, it's against the Spirit of God's leading if I do it. The Holy Spirit, the new man in me, doesn't, doesn't say that. See, I can still walk after the flesh, but I can't ever get back in the flesh again. So, whenever you talk about the baptism with the Holy Ghost, you're talking about something you can see. Now, there's not a person here that's had the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Anybody seen any tongues flying around here lately? Other than these? Seen no tongues like as a fire? You've never seen them in your life. If you had, you, you better get out of there because God's not doing that today. In the last days, Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. See, some unusual things going to take place. It shall come to pass in the last days. God I said, I will pour out of my spirit. By the way, it's one thing for God to pour out the spirit of God upon people. And it's another thing for you to be baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Two different things all together. Over here, you're dealing with uh, uh, where God pours out the Holy Ghost upon. And over here, the Spirit of God takes you and baptizes you into the Holy Ghost. Didn't Jesus say that if he didn't go away, you know, the comforter would not come? But if he departed, he would send him. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. He departed, and he sent forth the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the believers here. Over here, the Spirit of God takes you and puts you into the body of Christ. So there's some real, there's some real differences going on. Here, the Spirit of God, his work is very evident. It's very evident. It's outward. Now, look back at Acts chapter 1, verse 5. And put, your, put your thinking caps on with me and put your reading caps. You don't have to really think. Just read and look at the passages. And I, I want you to see this in, this, this in Acts chapter 2. This is, this is something that's visible. It's outward. It's something you see God. The, you see the results of God doing. Look at Acts 1, verse 5. John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, if you've got a Bible that says in the Holy Ghost or by the Holy Ghost, you need to get rid of it because what it's done, it's confused your Bible already for you. See, it's, it's confused. It's not baptism in the Holy Ghost. It's not baptism by the Holy Ghost. It's a baptism with the Holy Ghost. The Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 2, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the baptizer. And he sends forth the Holy Spirit. And that is in line with everything that he's promised in John 14 and John chapter 16, that if he departs, he will send forth the Holy Ghost. And he does. The Lord Jesus Christ is the baptizer. The Holy Spirit is the divine person. And the people are baptized with the Holy Ghost. He comes upon them. It's a baptism by pouring. That's where the old time Presbyterians had it on the Baptist. Because they found a baptism that was a pouring. And some others. Now Baptists, you know, they, they, they just can't get a hold of that thing because they want to be Baptists rather than Bible believers. Well, I want to be a Bible believer first, and then if it falls in, if the Baptists fall in line, fine. Amen. Amen. So this is a baptism with the Holy Ghost, and uh, you'll notice in verse eighteen. See, see, look at Acts two and verse eighteen. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out of my Spirit. You see that? Well, I can't get anything else but the Spirit of God coming up on people there. Uh, this is not baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
file up the prepositions here. Leave them just like they are in the Word of God, and you'll get it. Now, look over in, look over in, uh, I don't have to go there. I've got some other things. I'm going to get, I don't want to get bogged down. I don't want to get in these last, I just want you to see that there's some outward, visible things that go on with a baptism with the Holy Ghost. Tongues of fire, not tongues of fire, tongues like as of fire. If something is, is, is like as, it's not actually fire. This is not a baptism of fire. See? This is not a baptism with fire. These tongues are like as a fire. They weren't fire, but they had some characteristics of it. Notice, please, in verse number 17, he said, It shall come to pass, in the, it's Acts 2, verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Well, here, here you've got the spirit of God poured out upon all flesh. Now, people confusing times and not rightly dividing the book and seeing a difference in, in Paul's ministry. Peter, by the way, the Acts of the Apostles, first part of Acts, who's the Apostle? Simon Peter, you just met him in Acts 2. Last part of Acts, who's the apostle? Paul. Peter drops from the scene. You don't even know he's around after Acts 15. He's gone. Paul takes up the rest of it. It's the Acts of the Apostles, two of them. Simon Peter, speaking and spokesman for the Twelve here, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. It's the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts is a transition book. It's not a doctrinal book for you to follow you get as mixed up as a termite and a yo-yo if you try to follow doctrine in the book of Acts. Right. You got, you know, you just, you just fouled up if you do. So, so it's a book of transition. It's the Acts of the Apostles, not the doctrine for the church. Now later on you get to the doctrinal books. But in the book of Acts, God's showing you how it moves here from Israel to the church. And, and therein you're going to see some difference in these last days. In other words, Israel's got some last days. And the church has got some last days. Now, just to set things, you know, kind of in order, what is going to happen, God's going to fulfill these last days because over here, you're going to have those last days come back in again. And I've got the right color here for it. Those days over here were stopped. It began and they stopped. They're going to come back in over here in these last, over here, just before the Lord comes back. And he is going to bless Israel. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And his sons and his daughters, the daughters of Israel are going to prophesy. And then God's going to, especially his, his handmaids and servants and so on are going to prophesy over there. So these last days were not fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. They've never been fulfilled. Look, look at it. Was the Spirit of God poured out upon all flesh? Of course not. Instead of the Spirit of God being poured out upon all flesh, while these apostles are beaten, they're rejected, Jerusalem doesn't listen to the testimony of the Lord, and the Lord shuts Jerusalem, sets Jerusalem aside, and sends them to the Gentiles to carry the gospel. The kingdom is not set up. The Lord Jesus Christ is not accepted. He does not come back and... and uh, uh, take the throne of glory here upon this earth. Instead, folks, tonight he's still in heaven. He's still at the right hand of God the Father. That doesn't mean that he's never going to come back. It just means that something else is taking place. He said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And then in verse 19, I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. Before that great and notable day of the Lord comes, it shall come to pass. Whosoever shall call upon the name, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. While the great and notable day of the Lord hasn't come. You can find some isolated instances where you have, where you have uh, earthquakes or eclipses, uh, lunar eclipses or the sun, eclipse of the sun. You can find some disasters, uh, uh, local things, but you don't have the universal thing that's promised here 
in Acts chapter number 2, it's not just an eclipse. It's the sun turned into darkness. And the moon, he didn't say to be turned into something like blood. He said the moon into blood. Now, you think, you think God couldn't do that? I think he could. I believe God that made it could turn it into whatever he wanted to be. <laughs> I mean, God, I, I believe, see, I believe Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And if he, if he made the heaven and the earth, he can do anything with it along the way that he pleases. Amen. Son, can it be turned into darkness? Sure it can. God can blot the sun out whenever he wants to. He created not only the sun, but he created the light in between the earth and the sun whenever he created anyway. He created the stars, not only created those stars, but he created the light in between that star and this earth, so it just baffled some scientists whenever he sat back and he said, well, it'll take so many billion light years for that light to travel, therefore the earth can't be that old. No, you're thinking in a natural mind, dummy. When God created, he created with apparent age. When God created Adam, he created him, he looked like he was 33 and a half years old. You'd look at Adam, you'd thought he'd come up through, you know, you thought his mother would have carried him to daycare and kindergarten. He'd have had to learn his phonics and all that kind of stuff. Adam didn't have to learn those things. Adam was created with a parent age. He looked like he'd been around for 33 years. This universe looked like it'd been around for a long time, but it hadn't. God just threw the scientist's curve. <coughs> Apparent age. God didn't have to wait for amoebas to grow up to be whales. Understand? God didn't have to wait till a couple of growing seasons to get those uh, fruit trees in the garden to eat you know, you plant a peach tree, you don't get just peaches just right away, you know. God didn't have to wait. Word of God says there in Acts chapter number 2, the sun turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Well, folks, if we're in the great and notable day of the Lord, what in the world's going on? Where's God? Where's God? Where is the throne of his glory? The Bible means nothing if all these things have been fulfilled. But they haven't been fulfilled because there's another set of last days. Now Paul tells you this. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says there's another set of last days. Now while we're in 2 Timothy, before you, before you go to chapter 3, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at a Bible verse, verse number 7. 